everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on food production and the trade map, buying local versus buying global. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, and I'll be guiding us through this conversation coming at you live from the Euractiv studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Now, one of the biggest buzzwords in Brussels right now is sovereignty. People are talking about digital sovereignty, raw material sovereignty, medical sovereignty, military sovereignty, and food sovereignty. The idea is that Europe should be more self-sufficient and not so dependent, uh, particularly on large global competitors. Now, a big impetus for this push came from the trauma of the Trump years, but also rising fears of uh, an increasingly competitive China. Of course, a Europe that's pulling away from global supply chains would have an effect on every country outside of this continent. And today, we're going to be talking specifically about the effects on global trade of increased EU food sovereignty. Producing more food locally sounds good, but could it have unintentional knock-on effects? That's the question we'll be tackling today. Now, the concept of shorter food supply chains was already in the European Commission's Farm to Fork strategy, which attempts to extend the Green Deal to food. And now, in addition to those climate concerns, we, of course, have the concerns of the global COVID-19 pandemic. That's really reinforced the idea that health concerns uh, can also be affected by food security. But at the same time, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has aspired to make this a more geostrategic commission. So it's natural to ask, is there a conflict between that desire for a political geo geopolitical commission and a decoupling of the European market from the international food chain? Also, could such a move be met with a retaliatory sp response from global partners? And is such an idea even feasible in a world where the EU has a high degree of integration uh, between food production and global structures? For instance, the EU engaged in 254 billion euros worth of global agri-food trade in 2018. Would food delivery be affected? What about food diversity? Does food sovereignty mean that we in Europe would suddenly be faced with less food and less choice on our supermarket shelves? And how would this move toward local supply chains affect countries in the global south, and also in Europe's near neighborhood, who are export dependent? Now, before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. You guys are going to be able to ask your questions to the panelists today using the Q&A feature on Vimeo. Go ahead and type your questions in there, and I'll be reading out your questions to the panelists at the end of the discussion. Remember, that's only for questions. If you have comments or you'd like to uh, make a point or, or send out a link, uh, please use the chat function. Don't make statements in the Q&A. I won't be reading those out, so it would be a waste of your time. Uh, you can follow this discussion also on Twitter using the hashtag EA Debates right there below me. I uh, would like to get a good uh, back and forth going on Twitter. Uh, and so with all of that out of the way, let me introduce our very distinguished group of panelists that we have here today. From the European Commission, we have Rupert Schlegelmilch, Director of the Americas, Agriculture and Food Safety at the European Commission's Trade Department. Lea Offre, Senior Trade Policy Officer with the European Consumers Organization, Bayouk. Mario Jalis, Economic Affairs Officer at the Commodities Branch of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and Marco Sawaya Jenk, Professor of Global Agribusiness at the Institute of Education and Research in Brazil. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your insights on this topic. Let me start out with some general questions for each of you. Rupert, let's start with you. I've, I've referenced the Commission's Farm to Fork strategy there and some of the Commission's thinking. How does the Commission envision this balance between buying local and buying global in its Green Deal and its Farm to Fork strategies? Yes, thank you, Dave, and thanks uh, for the other panelists for being there and the audience. Uh, maybe let me start by saying uh, the obvious. Uh, we don't think uh, that sovereignty means production at home is the only thing you can do. Sovereignty, and to pick up on your point, actually means that you can determine your policies and that you can actually have choices uh, 
which are within certain rules uh, and possibly rules which actually uncover international trade. So the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, which are at the heart of this debate, uh, actually support the fact that international agri-food trade and locally produced food within short supply chains are not mutually exclusive. So it's not one versus the other. It's actually, if you think about food security and resilience of the system and sustainability of the system, you actually have to be diversifying and combining food supply channels from local and short chains to international trade. Just imagine a crisis and everything is concentrated in one spot on your food supply. Now, that's not a good policy. And this is what at the heart of this uh, undefined term of open strategic economy, autonomy, uh, which is part of our trade policy review, which we're actually uh, undertaking right now. Because, I mean, if you look at the crisis, uh, what actually came out of the crisis is that an interconnected global and diversified supply chain uh, supported by international multilateral cooperation with G20 and G7 uh, pronouncing themselves actually helped us to succeed in, in this pandemic stress test, if you wish. Uh, we were able to maintain varied quality and affordable food at all times, and that was not a given. There were quite a number of people when the first restrictive measures came who had doubts whether we could actually achieve that. The farm to fork strategy actually then offers tools and support to strengthen the short supply chains, which are part of the picture. It also recognizes the need to give consumer a choice to need to properly inform them on mandatory front, front pack nutrition labeling. And it will also have provenance indications as part of the strategy uh, to take uh, into account uh, what uh, the supply chain information actually is. Where does the stuff come from? At the same time, let's not be uh, ignorant of the fact, as I've said, that not only for food security, we need multiple sources of supply. Uh, global trade is also essential to providing additional complementary outlets for what we produce in Europe. High quality and value added European products, as you very well know, have not only an excellent reputation, they also sell very well. And if you look at the crisis numbers and think about the jobs that we want to maintain even in the midst of the crisis, it's worth pointing out that the food exports of the EU are the best sector compared to everything else. We actually had growth in the first six months of this year, uh, while we had sharp decreases on machinery, cars, chemicals, whatever you, you name it. So there is a, there is a constant uh, demand from emerging markets in particular that make it possible to maintain the jobs, the growth and the employment the employment in that sector. It also means that our operators who need inputs from the world markets can actually supply their short chains via fertilizer or machinery or other input they need in order to produce locally. So that is a little bit my opening bid. It's complementary, it's not one versus the other. It is a task that we will look at very, very closely in order to make sure that it fits with our green and climate policies. But we have no other choice being the biggest exporter in the world uh, and to say maintain the open markets and continue to trade uh, and also have longer supply chains, if you wish, from time to time. Thanks. Thanks, Rupert. Let's turn to Leia speaking on behalf of consumers. I referenced some of those concerns consumers might have about uh, shorter supply chains at the beginning. Um, what does the length of the food, si food supply chain mean for consumers when it comes down to the supermarket shelves? Yes, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to, to be here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity also for us to bring the consumer perspective into this very uh, interesting debate. Maybe before going to your question, um, a few words to explain uh, that we have the privilege at Bilk to represent 44 uh, national consumer organizations in 32 countries. And they are in contact uh, on a daily basis with millions of consumers. And one of the great things that we do together is to survey consumers to actually know what they want and what they expect. And it relates to your question, of course, because uh, the late survey that we later survey that we've done with them um, was about food sustainability. And it turns out that two thirds of consumers are now saying that they're ready to change their eating habits to reduce the impact that they have on the environment. 
And for most of them, local supply chain uh, is a synonym of sustainability. They really associate the two concepts. And for the debate today, what's important uh, to keep in mind is that a, we need to make sure that uh, trade policy is actually an enabler for consumers on their sustainability journey and to help them in their demand to bring the farm closer uh, to the fork. Um, and to reply to your question, uh, actually origin is one of the most important thing for consumers uh, when they are buying food. Uh, but uh, today it's still a bit difficult for them to know uh, where they are buying from. And uh, as Rupert was mentioning, this will be part of the farm to fork strategy and it's really important. And what will also be key is to make sure that the farm to fork strategy and the trade policy are going hand in hand. So we really need to make sure that trade policy will help a consumer uh, there. And um, because we really need to make sure also that basically trade rules will be compliant with the sustainable development goals. One of these is sustainable consumption. And we also need to make sure that imports coming in the EU will respect the basic rules that we have set up, labeling, food safety, uh, but also we should take into account other criteria like respecting uh, basic animal welfare standards, uh, pesticide, less input and pesticides, uh, and also fight together with other countries against antimicrobial resistance. So here we would need to, to see the trade policy a bit uh, braver on this aspect and really help consumer make the healthy and sustainable choice. And this is something that we would like to see reflected in the upcoming trade policy review. Makes sense. Mario, let's turn to you to get the global perspective here. What does the supply chain situation look like globally and how might it change? Uh, Mario, I think you might have to unmute your mic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I represent UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which is one of the many US, uh, UN agencies, and it's specialized on trade and development. So we work very closely with developing countries. Well, um, I think this debate on buying local versus buying global is very important, not only in the countries that are considering engaging that platform in a, in a in deeper, but it has repercussions on the entire world. Um, today, 51 countries are considered uh, dependent on food exports. So these countries are distributed throughout the entire planet, all continents. Um, usually there are some usual suspects like Brazil and Argentina that are pointed as big exporters, but there's a variety of countries from very, very many different levels of development that are also dependent on exports. Many small island countries, the SIDS, and countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, one other important aspect to take into consideration is that this level of dependence on food exports has increased over the last 20 years. And even now with the COVID situation, it has become even more extreme. Since exports have dropped in most sectors, but not in the food sector, as pointed out by our colleague from the European Union, this, is, this happened not only in the EU, but throughout the world. So countries that were already dependent on food exports are even more dependent on exports. For example, before COVID, uh, because of COVID, let's say, ex exports in general fell by 14% in, in Latin America, but food exports grew by 8%. So th the sector was already important for this region. It has become even more important. One other thing that we have to take into consideration is that COVID is not the only difficulty that we're facing now. We're faced also with the problem of climate change. Climate change has very important repercussions over food production as well. It has repercussions over poverty reduction and over hunger. So the fact that um, agriculture and fisheries are so affected by climate change implies that it will be harder and harder for the people that depend on these sectors to uh, be able to have a livelihood that allows them a good nutrition. So what we see, and it's very sad that the impact of climate change will be what will be the worst in the areas that are the poorest. So when we look into a world that's moving towards buying local and maybe buying less global, I see. I know that it's a combination of both, but, but it means that the global side would be losing part of its 
um, market share, let's say, to the local side. It means that for a lot of poor people in rural areas around the world, it will be harder to access markets abroad. One other thing that I think is important to take into consideration is that um, it's we, we must take into account that policies that are used to um, increase production locally for a shorter supply chain locally, we should make sure that they do not affect, that they're not trade distorting, that they do not, do not affect world prices in a way that discriminate producers in developing countries. Finally, I think it's also important to take into consideration consumers, and we have a representative from, from consumers in Europe here. Um, in this particular time in which COVID creates unemployment, in which in, uh, COVID reduces incomes around the world, and it's natural that a move towards local production would generate price increases. So it's, it's important to take into consideration how that would affect consumers as well. Um, finally, I think that we should look at trade as a part of the solution. And it's good that um, the European Union and other actors are looking into this uh, debate as a combination of both local and, and global. But I think it's important to make sure that this move is not followed by increase in domestic support that is prejudicial to producers outside of Europe. So I think with these words, I would like to conclude and I'm looking forward to the rest of the debate. Thanks a lot, Marco. Let's get an academic perspective from Marcos. Marcos, you've really been looking at these issues quite intensely. What kind of impact do you think that a push for shorter supply chains in Europe would have on global free trade? So, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for this invitation. Hope that you are listening to me well. Uh, I believe that the, the COVID crisis um, was not what we thought in the beginning in terms of the food supply chains, the global supply chains of food. In the, in the first month, we thought that it would be like a, a increased protectionism and countries closing frontiers like we saw in the 30s after the Great Depression. But actually, uh, the global supply chains are working quite well. And when I see uh, the message about short supply chains, I believe that this will probably happen more in Europe than in other parts of the world. If we look, for example, the Brazilian exports this year, we are going to export more than $100 billion, and this will be the, the, the record level uh, since the beginning. And we are looking at a very important increase of exports, especially to China and Hong Kong, because China is recovering fast from the COVID pandemic, but also because China have today problems in animal diseases, not only the COVID issue uh, in humans, but also, for example, the African swine fever that uh, uh, made a big problem of supply of meat in China. Uh, for example, what, what China lost in terms of pig production is more than two times the world market of, uh, of pig, so uh, pig meat. So uh, it's, it's really a, a problem today for China, the supply chains in, in the meat sector. Uh, we also see some some uh, movements coming uh, from other countries in Asia, for example, the ASEAN countries that are now uh, joining RCEP, uh, that the 10 countries in Southeast Asia. We also saw a big uh, increase of exports to this region and also to South Asia. So when I see these movements, especially in the direction of Asia, but in the future probably to Africa, I don't think that short supply chains will be a kind of solution for the world. I believe that this will happen in some uh, rich parts of the world, but most of the developing countries, they have problems as, as it was said by Mario, for example, climate change is, is an issue in, in most of the tropical countries. We also have issues of, uh, of you see, lack of market access, lack of productivity, uh, lack of water uh, and things like that. So uh, I really believe that for for those countries where we are seeing uh, per capita income growing three, four, five, six percent a year uh, in areas that we don't have enough land and enough water, I believe that long, long chains will, will be extremely important. And let's remember one point. Food supply chains are much less integrated than, for example, cell phones or, or computers or cars, etc. When you buy a cell phone, you are buying uh, 
parts from many different countries. But when, when we talk about food supply chains, there is still a lot of protectionism. Uh, and you see, for example, what happened uh, in the pork meat uh, uh, in China. You see, there's, no, there's not enough meat in the world because China is buying so much pork today that we don't find it in the world market. So it means that uh, on the supply chains of foods, we don't have much uh, uh, integration because countries uh, always uh, 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 prefer to buy, uh, 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 to produce themselves. So I believe that the risk of protectionism uh, is really bad for the world. Uh, if we go to food sovereignty in, term, in, uh, in world terms, we, we risk to, uh, to have more food insecurity in the world. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Marcos. As you mentioned, food is an area where there is already a lot of protectionism in terms of global trade, and it does operate differently from so many different sectors. Um, Rupert, I want to start with a question for you, because I know you have to leave shortly, and you'll be uh, take uh, your colleague Flavia will be taking over for you. But before you go, let me just ask you, uh, both Mario and Marcos were just talking about the pandemic. What would you say, the, from the Commission's perspective, what has the pandemic taught us about supply chains in general? Yes, thank you. I think, um, again, the, the, the crisis actually taught us that the system is quite resilient uh, because all these fears uh, about uh, closing down, uh, you know, keeping everything for yourself, as we have seen for some of the protective, uh, uh, the protective equipment, that was the tendency in the first weeks, has not happened. And I think it was because people realized that you just cannot uh, source uh, everything locally. Uh, we have the numbers, I mean, 10, depending on where you look, if you take 100 kilometers around the consumers, only 10, maybe up maximum of 25% can actually source everything they need within the 100 kilometer uh, perimeter. So it's, it was obviously obvious that uh, you have to maintain the system uh, of local and global supply chains. Uh, and I want to, I mean, I want to make one more comment so the crisis has taught us that the system is functioning and we better maintain it with all the rules we have. Um, and we strengthen it uh, where we can, of course, but uh, nothing has to be uh, fixed, which is really, really broken. Uh, I wanted to add one more thought because I, I listened very carefully also to the development uh, argument which came out of the discussion. Uh, this is not just a Eurocentric affair of local supply chains. Uh, these integrated markets and the growth of food exports of agriculture exports by six four by six times in the last 30 years has done a lot to alleviate poverty and i think it's worth mentioning that uh, that we're also by buying these things uh, we actually keep uh, a development model which has been quite successful uh, in, for many countries that doesn't mean that they don't have to diversify and that there are things which can be better but it's also important to point out one more fact and that is that distance is not the determining factor of sustainability. Uh, this, the transport cost, it all depends. An apple from New Zealand in now doesn't make sense, but if you have to cool your apple six months to eat it in May, it might very well be that the New Zealand apple, which comes from the Southern Hemisphere, produces less gas house emissions. Uh, that transport issue is six, uh, our calculation says it's 6% of the overall production um, that might occur, but how much fertilizer you use, how much energy you use, uh, growing bananas in Iceland, as some Icelanders do with uh, renewable energy, is an interesting calculation. But normally the effect of having the right climate, the right soil, the right water outweighs very often the transport cost, which is the first thing you think about when you think about sustainability. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rupert. So we'll swap you out with our, your colleague, uh, Flavio, now, I think. Take care, Rupert, and welcome, Flavio. Um, Leia, I want to ask you a question now um, about some of the scandals that we've seen in Europe. I mean, a lot of times when we think about food supply chain, Marcos was mentioning it is an area with existing protectionism. It is an area, I think, that's very emotional for people. Food is you know, it's something we put in our bodies, so it's something people care a lot about. And we've seen scandals in the past, for instance, the horse meat scandal in Europe, uh, where it turned out that horse meat was turning up in meat that was supposed to be something else. Uh, and that caused a lot of concern with consumers. Um, so what do you think we learned from those scandals in the past about the food supply chain in Europe and just how complex it is? <laughs> 
That's a very good question. Actually, what we have learned from the horsemeat scandal is that, first of all, it was a fraud huh? scandal. So meaning that there was a trader who actually misled a consumer into thinking uh, that it was beef meat instead of horse meat, and that she did the rules uh, in place. But it showed us something very important, is that there is, uh, it's a very complicated uh, supply chain, uh, even in Europe uh, with the disregard, and we have a lot of intermediaries. And that's also something that if we want to reduce the fraud, uh, we're not saying that local, I think local supply chains would solve all of these issues and would completely prevent fraud. Huh? Absolutely not, but it could be. Uh, part of a solution. Um, and also it showed us that we have a bit of an issue when it comes to official controls within the EU and we're lacking uh, resources uh, at EU member states uh, level to really have help veterinarians uh, conduct their job properly, they need human resources, they need financial resources. So that's something we need to, to, to really put in place. And maybe if I can come back a bit to what Robert was mentioning before with regard to transport, this is actually uh, something that, that we see also. Huh? And when we say that consumers want to bring the farm closer to the fork, it's not only to reduce the impact of transport, uh, because transport is just one part of the problem, but it's also because they want to support local producer. It's also because they want to know where, in, from which country the product can come from just to have an idea of what type of environmental standard, what type of labor rights are in place there to make the appropriate choice. Thanks. Uh, Flavio, let's, let's get you thrown in here as well. Let me put that same question to you. What did the commission learn uh, from the horse meat scandal in terms of supply chains? Uh, was the lesson that supply chains, supply chains need to be more simple and shorter, or was it a different lesson that the commission drew from that? I don't, I don't think that necessarily the lesson was that uh, supply chain should be shorter. Actually, the EU official control systems are really considered to be an example of best practice, uh, uh, not only in, in the EU, but worldwide. So, uh, and, and there are rules which provide also the national authorities, not only the commission, the necessary powers to implement and enforce the regulatory requirements we have. Uh, across uh, across the EU, um, and recently we also have a new official controls uh, regulation which came into force in uh, December last year, uh, which provides more targeted and also risk-based controls, um, and in particular it allows also to have new IT tools that uh, in, uh, provide an integrated and more efficient system. Um, definitely, there is much of the experience which we gained in the past, uh, which led actually to these uh, improvements in the new official controls regulation, uh, and these came through this regulation and entered into force last year. Uh, but we're also, as a commission, empowered to recommend uh, coordinated control plans uh, in order to establish whether there is a prevalence of hazards in feed, food, or animals. And at the moment, actually, in coordination with also with the national authorities, the Commission has uh, uh, invited and called member states to reinforce the vigilance on the control activities, uh, in particular on food related to COVID-19. So I think that really there has been much of an experience which has uh, fed, uh, which, which has fed actually into the into the new legislation and in particular the new focus on enforcement and IT tools which uh, uh, hopefully will eventually improve the whole efficiency of the system. Thanks. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, you guys can also ask your questions to the panelists using the Q&A feature on Vimeo. Uh, Mario, I have a question for you. Um, when we're thinking about possible retaliatory measures, what I mentioned in the introduction, uh, if you're looking at the global supply chain, Let's say that the EU uh, did put in measures to encourage or enforce more local supply chains that uh, might result in uh, less exports from a third country. What type of retaliatory measures might third countries uh, undertake in that scenario? Or would they try to find some other way to uh, 
to resolve that? Well, um, first of all, retaliatory measures are usually also not beneficial to the country that applies them. So usually they're used to try to convince your trade partner to go in a certain direction, or but they also generate, um, let's say, negative effects on the economy that's applying them. So the best best out, outcome would be for the countries to negotiate them without having to retaliate. In the past, countries have retaliated in specific areas. We have recent examples from two of the major world powers that have been going on a sort of, um, let's say, trade war recently. We have um, even in other areas that are not on agriculture and food, like in the oil um, sector, we've seen that countries tend to retaliate and create a situation that's actually not too beneficial to either of them. Look, for example, what has happened in the oil sector between Saudi Arabia and Iran and the, the war on prices. So the best, uh, the best outcome is not an outcome that involves retaliations. So that we know, it's a general fact. But yes, countries could resolve to retaliation, let's say, if a country that exports agricultural goods loses a large share of their export market in a certain country, they might take actions to also limit their imports of certain goods from that, those countries. So it could happen. It's not ideal. It's not recommended to the countries to engage on that. But it historic, historically has happened. And we have recent, recent examples. For an example, um, we know that China and the United States have had some uh, issues on the trade sphere. And China, as one of its um, uh, actions, has reduced purchases from the US of certain agricultural goods. Third countries have benefited from that. So there are some, also some side effects because if the US is exporting less, it means that China needs to buy it from other countries. So the, there is there's a whole dynamic situation in which um, benefits are created to third powers, but parties, but it's not necessarily in the best interest of the country to retaliate. So politics comes before economics when retaliations are taken. Marcos, let me put the same question to you. Do you think such moves would result in retaliatory measures? Uh, I believe that if we have a strong WTO system and a dispute settlement, it could happen retaliations because we see a lot of uh, distortive subsidies in the world. Uh, and if countries move to, to re, uh, 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 increase tariffs or increase non-tariff barriers, it could happen as some retaliation, yes. But as Mario said, this is not good for the world. Because I, I believe that short or long or long supply chains could, uh, should be a choice of the consumers in each country. Here in Sao Paulo, probably people who want a, a short chain because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, much richer than the rest of the country. But if you go to the poor zones, there is still a lot of problems of supply, especially in Africa, in Asia. So uh, I believe that countries should uh, should choose. The problem is the risk of protectionism and the risk of uh, higher tariffs, higher non-tariff barriers. And I believe that we should think that uh, countries today, they look uh, food security in one side. Uh, they look for affordability of products. They look for food safety and quality. And this is a very important issue after COVID-19 because we have diseases such as African swine fever, avian influenza, even COVID has a lot of risks uh, that could happen in the future if we have other zoonotic pandemics and we should take care of that. We have sustainability issues because, especially because of the climate change uh, uh, pressure. So if countries want to have food security, food safety, affordability and sustainability, they cannot have this if they keep very high uh barriers in terms of imports you see because this would be a, a real disaster for the world so my opinion is let, let's see long or short as a as a national choice in terms of the consumers each each part of the countries at least but not see this in terms of, in, in terms of the world because this would be very very bad and then if countries move to the wto and, and if we have the wto uh, reinforced by Joe Biden now because we believe that Biden will be different of Trump in terms of the of the multilateral uh, 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 system. So I believe that we could have a lot of retaliation 
as a consequence of higher tariffs and higher non-tariff barriers. Flavio, let me get your response to that. So we heard, you know, retaliatory measures are not desirable but could happen. Um, in the Commission's view, are, are shorter supply chains feasible in a globalized world, both when you, when you look at the, the practicalities, but also when you think about the potential response? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. Uh, feasibility, um, it's probably not uh, possible. I mean, it's, uh, there are, I mean, as been said before, I think uh, food supply chains are highly integrated uh, and both upstream and downstream, there is a strong dependence. And this applies not only to big farms and big uh, um, uh, companies, but also to small producers. Um, not only in terms of exports, because we need uh, to export and we are actually, as the EU, first uh, exporters in the world uh, in terms of uh, food products, um, but also in terms of inputs. So it's not only a question of finding outlets, but also it's a question of relying upon a number of uh, inputs, fertilizer seeds, machineries and raw materials, which we cannot possibly find in, in the EU. So. Um, as as we said before, I think it's a question of complementarity rather than exclusivity between uh, uh, local and global uh, production. Um, there is uh, clearly also an effect in terms of uh, uh, downstream uh, sector uh, and uh, what the potential effects would, would that in, in, entail. So I think also for consumers having a diversity of, of food and allowing consumers to, to, to have a broader choices of food in terms of quality, in terms of diversity. It's also something which we need to take into, into consideration. Would, uh, should we go down the road of uh, purely local production replacing trade that would certainly increase costs, which would not necessarily be to the benefit of uh, producers, but not necessarily be to the benefit of consumers either. Leia, I mean, it sounds like there is a conflict here between what consumers want and what's feasible to deliver. Uh, you mentioned that consumers want shorter supply chains both for environmental reasons and for health reasons, and yet we're really hearing that delivering that is, is laden with complications. What do you think consumers' reaction would be uh, when they hear all of the, the reasons why making supply chains shorter would be difficult? Well. The good news for us is that with the farm to fork strategy, we will have two good answers on that. The first one being on diversity, because of course, uh, consumers want to have a wide range of choice and have quite a diverse um, choice of food they can buy. And here, uh, it's good that the farm to fork strategy actually wants to both make sure that we can have, in some cases, shorter supply chain, but at the same time, enhance the diversity of products within the EU. Um, so for instance, changing a bit the way we produce in the EU, uh, meaning more pulse uh, and, and beans and things like this, and to make sure that consumers will have local and seasonal fresh food at their disposal, although it means that we will need to upgrade a bit our cooking skills for forbidden, uh, forgotten uh, vegetables. Uh, but of course, it doesn't mean um, that we will stop importing goods. Huh? Uh, we will rely on uh, imports from uh, cocoa, coffee, mango, and so on. Um, the farm to fork strategy doesn't mean that we'll Europe is closed for business and we're stopping imports. It's still very important also for consumers. Um, but we were before talking about consumer choice and it's up for consumers to, to, to make an informed decision. But you know, I mean, again, in most of cases, we don't know. And that's the case for prepared food, for instance, where there is uh, yet no uh, labeling, for instance, of the origin of meat used in, in transformed uh, product. Um, so it's a bit hard for them to, to make this decision. So we also need to look at this at EU level to really improve the way we uh, inform consumers about the origin and also the aspects of uh, sustainability. And when it comes to affordability here again, of course, the idea is not to, um, I mean, um, create pro financial problems for consumers. 
And here, the farm to fork strategy also will look at how to make the healthy and sustainable choice the most affordable one. And this is something uh, that, that we need to, to look at. Uh, it shouldn't be, uh, to, shouldn't be impossible for consumers to access uh, sustainable and healthy products. So this is something that we will be looking at in the coming years with the implementation of the farm to fork strategy and that we will accompany, of course, and we will be the watchdog for consumers to make sure it happens. But again, uh, it's not about closing the, the border for imports either. So, I mean, it sounds like essentially, as you say, some foods obviously can't be grown in Europe, so those would continue to have long supply chains, but that food which can be grown in Europe uh, would have shorter supply chains, and some of that food is stuff that people aren't currently eating, uh, but maybe could learn to, to start eating and improve their cooking, as you say. Um, we've got tons of questions coming in from the audience. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to take some of your questions now for the panelists. Uh, I'll start with a question uh, from Erica Quendler. She asks, what are some of the main existing tools or mechanism for enabling localized supply chains, and how can we help make them successful in the long term? Uh, Mario, let me start with you on that. What are some of the tools can be used to that can be used uh, to enable localized supply chains, keeping in mind all of the complexities that we've talked about so far? One of the traditional set of policies which are traditionally dealt with at the, at the WTO are the domestic support type of policies. So governments have had many different mechanisms that they've used to support producers. So many times this happens in context of countries that are high income countries where farming has much higher costs than in other parts of the world. So traditionally, this type of countries have supported local producers. In over time, the type of support given has changed. Originally, most of this support was very trade distorting. So by that, I mean that would directly affect world prices and trade flows. As part of the GATT and WTO negotiations, countries have moved towards less trade distorting support. So this is a journey that should have had taken place already. This transition should have had, had, should have had happened as part of the Doha round at the WTO but it's something that never got completed. So today we're, 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 we see a trade sphere in which agriculture is a lot more protected than the other sectors. So what type of measures are these? Some of these measures are payments directly made to producers. Sometimes these payments are payments that are uh, based on the level of production. Other times they're based on the amount of land a producer has and so on. There are many different schemes and these different schemes will affect or distort trade in different ways. So the WTO and the international community of experts encourages countries to select policies to support their producers that are less trade distorting. So this is one sort of a mechanism, the one that's traditionally discussed at the WTO, that um, has been used to support local production. There are other ways in which countries can also influence producers, and this is by, produce, by supporting uh, uh, providing support that's not specific to a certain produ produce. Europe has moved into that into that direction of, for example, paying producers for their environmental services because a farm has other side benefits in addition to the produce that they provide to society. So there are mechanisms that can be used, such such as this type of payments that are less connected to production and therefore generate less support. A third way in which governments can support local production is by having, for example, campaigns to motivate domestic consumption. Sometimes, or, or for example, supermarkets, they have their own distribution rules that sometimes they create their own rules of, um, let's say, having some sort of standards of buying products that affect international trade, even though even if governments are not direct, directly involved. So these are some of the areas. Flavia, what do you think about those tools? Are those tools that the Commission is also considering? Yeah, there are traditionally a number of tools which uh, some correspond to what Mario has just mentioned, which are which we provide in, uh, through through the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, some of these fall under the so-called second 
pillar. So this is the support we give to rural development. And as Mario said, this fall into the category of non-trade distorting support. So classified under green box of the, of the WTO precisely because they are not linked to production, uh, not increasing production, not distorting trade. This is the type of payments, for example, we give in order to support the restructuring of farms uh, in order to modernize uh, and uh, make it more viable from a WT from, a, from an economic point of view, uh, but also other environmental payments which are given in order to compensate costs uh, if uh, uh, farmers want to deliver more environmental benefits uh, for their production. Or it could be payments we give, for example, in less favored areas. Uh, there is a, a big problem in, in, in the EU, that's uh, the aging of population, uh, the farming population, and also rural exodus. So there are areas in the EU where rural areas are clearly abandoned, which creates a problem not only in terms of social problems, but also in terms of environmental effects because of soil degradation. And this is a, a key resource we need to preserve. So having farmers in rural areas uh, and staying there and doing their work, it's, a, it's key not, not only from a social point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. And this is where local and short supply chain can play a role in terms of rural connectivity, in terms of establishing connection and shorter chain and allowing uh, small producers in rural areas to get some more value added out of the value of the food supply chain uh, to the benefit of their economic activity. But doing this through a form of support, as I said, which is non-production and non-trade uh, distorting. And if I may, just very quickly, there is a second tool, which is extremely important, which doesn't involve any uh, pouring money uh, or public money, but it's rather a question of transparency. It's labeling and uh, under the farm to fork, the commission will reflect upon uh, further enlarging actually the origin labeling to a broader number of products in order to allow consumers to be empowered and be informed about uh, the origin or the provenance of, of the product that they, uh, they buy. So there is some value actually, there is value, a lot of value actually in, in short supply chain in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, providing consumers the, the necessary information, but also keeping uh, some rural areas alive uh, uh, in order to fight uh, both uh, social and economic uh, uh, objectives. Well, I've got two related questions here from Tommaso Ferrando from the University of Antwerp. Uh, Marcos, let me put these questions to you. Uh, Tommaso's first question is, uh, the OECD links an increase in international trade with a surge in greenhouse gas emissions by 290% in 2050. Isn't it a concern when pushing for long chains? Uh, and he has a second question here. Uh, only 30% of global food enters the global value chains, uh, uh, which is mostly oil seeds and meat. Is international trade really what feeds the world? So, Marcos, let me put both those questions to you. Well, first of all, let me just remember that the European Union is the is the first world exporter of agri-food products, but it's also the first uh, importer. So, uh, Europe has a role today in terms of. Uh, uh, buying buying uh, food from many different countries. Look, for example, the case of uh, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, a country that is exporting almost a hundred billion dollars, uh, especially uh, intra Europe, but also is importing seventy billion dollars from lots of of countries. So it's 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 value adding product. So this is this is a very important point: uh, the possibility to buy from other countries and to value add it. And, and in my opinion, uh, local local production can can raise greenhouse gases too. Uh, for example, like it it was the example of the apples uh, just before. So if you are trying to conserve these apples, it could cost much more than buying from other countries that are that are producing apples in different uh, 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 seasons of the world. <clears throat> and uh, on the other side, we needed to remember that in many countries there's not a possibility to increase uh, productivity because there's a lack of water or a, a lack of land or, or you see climate problems. So the only solution will be uh, 
buying from other countries. We are seeing this in Asia today. Asia has been growing so much in terms of per capita income. Uh, for example, Chinese, uh, ha uh, China had 20% uh, of urban population in 78 during the reforms of, of uh, Deng Xiaoping and, and now has a uh, 60% of urban population. So 40 percentage points in 40 years. And that's why China today is the biggest buyer of the seafood uh, just after Europe, but it will uh, surpass Europe in a few years. So uh, I don't see a solution for China, for example, uh, buying local because uh, they, they will need to buy uh, soybeans, corn, you see uh, meat and many other products. So the answer to you is uh, we needed to look food security, food safety, affordability, which means the, the cost to consumers, you see, and sustainability as one package, you see, and, and this package cannot be solved through uh, protectionism, see, national protectionism. I think that the, the main message here is if you want to have short chains or long chains, it's a choice of the consumer, but don't try to do this through protectionism because protectionism will mean food insecurity, especially in developing countries in Asia and in Africa. Did anyone else have a thought on that? Yes, Leah? Leah? Yeah, just to make sure that um, we make a distinction here. Um, the farm to fork strategy, for example, if we look at the example of, of the EU, uh, this is not a protectionist measure, and I, I think it's important to clarify it to all of our trading partners also. The idea is not to create kind of disguised protectionist measure to make sure we don't have foreign competition on our market, it's that we need to make our, our food system greener and more sustainable because there is a growing demand from consumers, but also because we have a growing, I mean, an, a challenge that we, we need to absolutely to address, which is climate change. Um, so here I, I completely see your point, but Sometimes we have this argument that we are facing, especially in the trade bubble. Uh, whenever we try to address some key issues like this, uh, we hear the protectionist card. Um, and that is also why we need to address this issue uh, in the World Trade Organization, for example, because each time in the EU that we want to regulate, let's say to inform consumers or to have a new labeling to help them make the healthy choice uh, such as the Nutri-Score for instance or if we want to make product more repairable and help consumers in that way we will always be afraid in the EU to uh, have some rules that we will not be WTO compliant and to face retaliation uh, from our trading partners and now we are, have this exercise in the EU to reform the World Trade Organization which is a good one uh, but we are a bit missing the point also because we have very old agreement on uh, food safety, on technical barriers to trade, which touch upon labeling, and this is what we need to update as well. It is really high time that these trade rules are, need to become compliant with the sustainable development goals because today it's the other way around, and that is why we will always have this discussion against protectionist measure or not protectionist measure because we need to update a bit this trade debate uh, with the sustainability debate and we're a bit lagging behind so far. I have a question, next question for Flavio. It's a, from an anonymous questioner. Uh, so it, it actually references a point that Marcos was making before. Uh, the EU is the biggest food exporter in the world. How are geopolitics taken into consideration for the design of strategy? Uh, so, I mean, Flavio, is, do you think that the EU is fully leveraging all of the, the weight it has in this global market in order to deliver on, on its objectives, including the farm to fork strategy and the Green Deal? I think that a lot has been done over, over the last 15 years or, or 20 years. Uh, the network of FDA that we have established, particularly uh, after after 2008, um, indeed makes it that we have roughly 30% of our exports are covered by bilateral trade uh, in terms of FDA, and 40% of our imports are covered in terms of uh, coming from FDA partners. So it's a it's a big network, 
Um, and I think that we have been leveraging these network and these FTAs in order to get as much as we could in terms of sustainability objectives, notably through the inclusion of a trade and sustainability chapter in all uh, the, the most recent FTA, including the one which is currently being discussed on Mercosur, which incorporates an, um, a, a key commitment from the two blocks, the EU and Mercosur, to effectively implement, for example, the Paris Agreement, which is extremely important in terms of climate, climate change. Now, is it enough? Uh, probably not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had uh, as such an initiative as the Farm to Fork, which uh, uh, in, defines a number of objectives in order to enhance the possibility to leverage FDA at bilateral level um, by making sure that we uh, not only can improve uh, the trade and sustainability chapter by including systematically the Paris commitments in future FTAs, uh, but also in terms of enforcement and implementation to make sure that the Commission can avail itself of the necessary tools to enforce um, all the sustainability uh, clauses and, and, uh, and the rules that we uh, have been negotiating and will be negotiating with trade partners. In this context, in my NDG, uh, we have a new uh, CTO, we call it. It's a Chief Trade Enforcement Officer. It's a Deputy Director General which has just been created and which uh, will uh, supervise and make sure that there are synergies and consistency between uh, the different enforcement actions of the Commission uh, across the board, uh, 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 in particular in the trade policy area. But I, I would like just to mention that not only in terms of bilateral agreements, we are also trying through unilateral actions, but also in terms of our uh, cooperation with trade partners in multilateral fora, uh, trying to push forward and enhance also the cooperation between uh, partners in order to make sure that, for example, in terms of developing standards worldwide, we can reach a consensus on higher standards uh, for human, animal safety, uh, and uh, uh, and the likes. Mario, Mario, you're looking at these issues at a global level, a kind of neutral arbiter here. Do you think that the EU is fully using its global clout as the world's largest food exporter uh, in reaching the, the, the goals and targets that it's set? Well, the EU definitely has set a precedence. It's a world leader in having this type of um, uh, set of trade agreements, of course, the inside Europe, but with the near Middle East and throughout the world, and Mercosur being the, the most recent one, it has a very important clout over other countries. So countries value the access they have to the European market. Many developing countries have access to preferential in a preferential basis to Europe. So this is also a special relationship that the European Union has with some developing areas of the world. So I do think the EU. Uh, compared to most areas of the world, has a very well-developed set of linkages with uh, with trading partners. These trading partners value the, the shares of the market that they have in Europe, and they are afraid of losing some of that. So they're watching very closely at what is what might happen in this move of the EU uh, in the direction of uh, more local uh, production. So I do believe at the same time, as was mentioned by Leah, our colleague uh, represent consumers, that at the global level, especially at the WTO, the rules were developed a while ago. When they were developed, many of the issues such as climate change were not so pressing. People were not considering them that much. So now we see that Europe is leading the world into adopting measures that would help fight climate change, which is a positive thing. All, all countries in the world should be interested in combating climate change. So I commend Europe for being a leader in this area. But the problem here is that we, we will be bringing this very important issue to the table, but we're still leaving another very important issue, which is development outside. You know, uh, I'm speaking specifically about the agricultural negotiations at the WTO. 
the Doha round, which initiated in 2001, 2003, should have dealt with so many of these complicated issues related to agriculture. Agriculture is a very, the markets in agriculture is not as open as elsewhere. elsewhere. There are a lot more subsidies in agriculture and fisheries than elsewhere. So these sort of issues that are very important for developing countries have been not dealt with. And they must be dealt with, just like climate change that needs to be dealt with and the environment needs to be dealt with. So I would commend Europe for also resurrecting the debate on development by uh, liberalizing trade in agriculture, because agriculture is very important for developing countries. So it is essential to reformulate the uh, trade negotiation arena. Yes, it's important to uh, take climate change seriously and adapt rule, world, international multilateral rules. But let's not forget about the development round because it has kind of evaporated from the original commitments that many countries made, including the European Union. Marcos, what about you? How do you assess how the EU is, is using its clout in global food trade? Uh, I think that sometimes Europe wants to, let's say, uh, direct uh, uh, other countries, move other countries in the direction of what Europe is doing. But Europe is, uh, is in a level of, you see, food, food chain integration, and a level of, you see, uh, consumers' expenses that's much different of the, of the developing countries. You see, uh, as I saw living in Asia for five years, and I've been living and working for the Brazilian exporters there, the Brazilian food exporters, uh, I see many different drivers and many different speeds in, in food chains in the world. For example, developing countries, they are still looking for food security. They are looking for techniques to increase productivity. And they are very concerned about affordability in urban areas. You see, because when, when people move from rural areas to urban areas very fast, they leave a short supply chain because they were farmers and they were self-consuming their products to uh, a much longer chain and a much more complicated chain. And in many of, of the developing countries, the healthy plate uh, that, we, that we see in Europe in terms of the best uh, combination of, you see, uh, animal protein, vegetable protein, fruits, vegetables, etc., is very, very expensive. In developing countries, what's, what's cheap is carbs, is, is let's say, uh, food that's not very uh, healthy. You see? So there's a big, a big issue there in terms of moving their supply chains to something close to what we have here in Brazil or in Europe. Uh, in China, the big concern is not uh, uh, um, uh, food security anymore. It's much more uh, on the food safety side today. They are facing trouble in terms of animal diseases, in terms of, uh, of, of the risk of new pandemics, especially in Asia, because there, is a, there are a lot of wet markets where, where the problems are, 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 very, are very complicated. And there's also the issue of you see, climate change and you see, uh, deforestation and things like that. Uh, and in Europe, there's concerns uh, like the local, uh, veggie, uh, uh, non-GMO, uh, much less uh, uh, pesticides, and, and this kind of model is, is very good for Europe, but it's very difficult to implement in other parts of the world, because one of the consequences of this, of this mo model will be a much uh, more expensive food that will not be affordable for the consumers, and, and those countries still have very basic problems uh, like mark, uh, market access and see, uh, infrastructure, productivity. So I see that the world has different drivers, different speeds, and Europe being the first world exporter and exporting value-added products to the world, and also a big importer because of the preferential tariffs, uh, especially with Africa, but other parts of the world, Europe has a role to understand these different uh, speeds of the world and try to not not try to uh, impose the European model in other parts of the world because this will not uh, work well you see and I've been living on on those parts of the world and uh, 
I think there are really different systems and different speeds. Uh, I believe that probably in the future we could move to something closer. But right now, there is still a big, big difference between countries in food supply chains. Leo, we have a question for you next. This question is from Sarah Ann Arup. How can producers and governments create initiatives to better inform consumers about the CA2 footprint of food products, and I suppose in particular food products with a long supply chain? So thank you very much, Stana, for this question. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the food expert in my office, but the trade expert, so I'm not going to be able to uh, reply specifically for on uh, the, your question. I know that it is part of the Farm to Fork strategy, this initiative to better inform consumers about the sustainability of the products, so potentially including information on uh, CO2. Um, but that's something also uh, we are looking at with our members on how we could actually give inf valuable information to consumers. And here we are not only looking at the, this aspect, but other um, aspects of goods, uh, such as environmental standard, the, uh, the use of pesticides, for instance, and so on. So it's a combination of different factors that consumers need to be aware of uh, on top of the origin of products that will help them really make the uh, healthy and sustainable choice. Fair enough. Uh, now let's take a final question from Neria Garcia Arizaleta. Uh, is the commission, this is a question for you, uh, uh, Fluvio, uh, is the commission going to work on an initiative that enforces a shared responsibility across the supply chain? Uh, Flavio, question for you. Yes, there will be an effort from uh, the commission um to look at uh, how um we can act, for example minimize the effects of uh possibly buying products from uh, areas which would come uh, from unsustainable practices um, the mention which, which the most obvious mention is in, in the farm to four strategies relates to deforestation uh, and deforested uh, areas. So there is the intention by the Commission, for example, to look next year at how in the different uh, uh, sections of the supply chain uh, there could be the possibility to introduce uh, an obligation of due diligence uh, for uh, producers who would have to justify um where the product how the product is produced uh, um, and to make sure that uh, certain products are produced uh, in a sustainable way or or say it in an opposite or in a, a contrary way that they are not produced in an unsustainable uh, way but this is very much work um in progress um we're gathering information and the intention is next year to come forward with uh, possibly with proposals on that. Um, and that's certainly something which touches upon also the question how to make sure that the whole uh, food supply chain is, uh, is, is more sustainable. There is uh, currently a timber regulation which foresees a certain uh, obligation of due diligence for importers and, and uh, of timber in, in the EU. Um, it will be one of the source of inspiration and uh, colleagues will be looking at that very closely in terms of uh, trying to find whether there is a useful experience that we can draw from uh, the timber regulation and trying to see if these can be enlarged also to other areas of the of the of, of the of the economy in this case in the food supply supply chain so i've looked at, i've replied in terms of actually sustainability because i think the question was more related to how to make sure that the different sections of the supply chain remain sustainable. Makes sense. Well, a lot of really interesting aspects to this discussion as we've seen in the course of this conversation. Let me get some very quick closing remarks from each of you. Um, let's start with Leia first, ladies first. Um, what, what do you think are the key takeaways that we've really learned in the course of this conversation? That's a good question. Um, 
for me, it was really interesting to, to hear the different perspective. Uh, and it's true that it's important for us to keep also in mind the, the development uh, aspect of this uh, discussion. And sometimes in the EU, we, we stay in our bubble and, we, and we, we look at this angle only. Although really, I mean, for us, uh, from the consumer angle, uh, it's really important that we make sure that what comes into consumer plates really respect the rules of the game. So here we're not, of course, asking um, foreign producers and foreign farmers to comply with all our, our rules, but at least some of our rules, the rules of the game on food safety, on labeling, but we need also to look at other issues, including uh, pesticides, animal welfare, the need to fight against uh, anti uh, microbial resistance. And what I took away also is that it's really interesting to see how we can also break the silos between the different policy areas. Uh, so we've talked about the EU Green Deal, we've talked about the farm to fork strategy, the EU trade policy, and that's something we need to take uh, more into consideration, uh, especially when we talk about short and long supply chains, we need to bring all the different aspects together and have this type of debate to improve further our policies. Mario, what are your key takeaways? I would say the, uh, one of the key takeaways is that this move towards sustainable agriculture, sustainable food systems is a very positive move, but that we must take in consideration also the development repercussions, like Leah already mentioned. Uh, there are 51 countries that depend on agricultural exports. When I say depend, is that over 33%, one third of their exports are agricultural exports. So for these countries, any measures taken by trade partners will affect them deeply. So looking forward in a world in which we're faced with pandemics, health is also very important. So it's understandable that countries will, will be concerned about that. So trade should be seen as part of the solution and not as the enemy. Like our colleagues from the EU have already pointed out, a traded, traded product, a product that might come from a different continent, is not necessarily less sustainable than a locally produced product. So that varies from case to case. In some cases, it is true. In some cases, it's not true. So I think it's very important that both sides of the debate are aware and recognize that. So I think that's a very positive outcome. So finally, moving forward, that uh, developing countries and their concerns of development should be taken into account in the in the world arena. So we should not just focus on what might be um, sustainable from the point of view of a local consumer, but what might be uh, more beneficial to consumers or producers around the world. Uh, Marcos, what are your final thoughts? Oh, it's just to reinforce. First, thank you for this invitation. It was it was a very nice uh, discussion. Uh, my final thoughts are about uh, internal food systems in the countries and and trade. So let's let's start by by the food systems, by the food chains in each country. I, I really believe that there are different drivers and different speeds in the world. So when I see countries in Africa and in Asia, for example, even knowing that in some in some capitals we have consumers very close to what we see in Europe, but when you look 80% of the population in India or in Africa, we are going to see a lot of problems in terms of food security, productivity, affordability, usage of, of water, you see, and, and you see climate change issues. So this is their driver is much more in, in terms of, you see, giving uh, affordable food, quantities of food to the population. When you look China today and, and other countries, we see food safety issues coming, coming before even uh, climate change, you see, and, and many problems in terms of animal diseases, in terms of coordination of the supply chains, in terms of, you see, quality uh, questions and also sanitary issues. And then in Europe, we have everything that was mentioned by Leah, uh, all the concerns about pesticides, about environment, about animal welfare, you see, etc. much more uh, uh, higher in terms of the priority compared to, for example, Africa. Uh, so I believe that you need to understand that the world is very complex, it's very heterogeneous, and after the pandemic, we are going to see a lot of changes in many areas of the supply chain, of the food supply chain. Uh, when we talk about trade, uh, I believe that there is uh, two two bad ideas there. One one bad idea is trying to impose a model. There is not a model. You see, the the 
Europe being the first exporter and the first importer today, it will not be the first importer in the future. I think it will be China and in the future India. But right now, Europe has a role importing commodities from very poor countries and on the other side, exporting also value-added products to lots of countries. So Europe should understand this difference in the world and the different drivers in one side. And what's really very important is that protectionism is never a solution, never. You see, uh, if we go to, to, to food sovereignty, uh, food nationalism, uh, uh, food self-sufficiency, you see, these kind of solutions will bring food insecurity in the world and, we'll have, and we are going to have a lot of problems because of that. So thank you very much. Thanks. And finally, uh, Flavio, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I think this discussion has uh, showed me once again the variety and the number of arguments uh, in favor of uh, coexistence between local uh, production and short supply chain and and trade and that there should not be contradiction of course we should be careful and and very uh, very careful about what lea told us which, which is a well known fact is consumers they do attach a lot of importance to local uh, production because their perception is that this is better in terms of sustainability um, and we have to take this uh, consideration seriously. We have to inform them, improve uh, labeling. We also have to take into consideration rural uh, objectives in uh, the poor area for the reasons I mentioned uh, before. But at the same time, I think we need to be clear that uh, what matters in terms of sustainability is not so much where uh, uh, the uh, product is produced, but it's rather what type of product uh, it deals with uh, so in, in this in this sense one product is different from another in terms of carbon footprint but also the way uh, products different products are produced and the methods of production can be sustainable or unsustainable uh, depending on a variety of uh, elements amongst which uh, agricultural practices which may be bad or good depending uh, on a variety of elements and not necessarily depending where and how long or short the supply chain uh, is. But this doesn't deprive us or doesn't prevent us from taking, as I said, seriously the consideration of consumers and informing them, empowering them to make sure that they make the right, uh, the right choices. Thanks, Flavio, and thank you to all of our panelists for joining us from near and far, and also to the audience for some really fantastic questions. I think this is a discussion that's obviously going to continue uh, very strongly here in Brussels with the Farm to Fork strategy being so debated and so many policy tools still yet to be implemented. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today, and we'll see you for the next Your Active Debate. Take care.